The Catholic Church, as its name states, includes persons of every race and nation and people of diverse theologies and political views. But there is fundamental agreement on doctrine and values. And the fundamental value, of course, is respect for life. Our speaker today is a powerful exemplar of the earthly and heavenly reality of the Church. If influence is a form of power, Gloria Purvis is a powerful Catholic black woman. She's a graduate of Cornell University in upstate New York, near where I am from, which is an area known for its pioneers in the struggle for equal rights, people such as Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony. She is associated with the Mother Church of Black Catholics, St. Augustine's Parish in Washington, D.C., the pastor of which was the assistant pastor of my parish in suburban Maryland, and who started me on the path that led me to the monastery. But Ms. Purvis' influence comes from her work for religious liberty with the U.S. Catholic bishops, for the Archdiocese of Washington on its pastoral council, for the Northwest Center Maternity Home and Pregnancy Center, for the Maryland Catholic Congress's Respect for Life Department, for the National Black Catholic Congress Commission on Social Justice, and as chairperson for Black Catholics United for Life. Her influence comes from her eloquent work as an insightful broadcast podcast journalist with the Jesuit American Media, and formerly at EWTN. And you wouldn't necessarily think that the same person could work with both of those organizations. <laughs> and she has appeared in the national secular media, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and PBS. But today, she is appearing here to talk to you. So it's my honor to introduce Gloria Burns. But we had just demolished the cafeteria. It was a mess. 
But we also understood as kids that really that's not fair to the janitorial staff to have to clean up that mess after all our merrymaking. And maybe you all should think like that, but uh, that somebody actually, actually have to pick up after you, so maybe that'll spur you to clean up after yourself in the cafeteria. So, and also we didn't want to get punished. So we got the mop and the broom and the pail and the place was spick and span and we were feeling really, really good about ourselves that we had done this. And uh, we had class after, after our recess. It was religion class and the problem was the religion class was taught by a religious sister. And the religious sister was also a principal, the principal of the school. And she was not impressed that we had cleaned up so thoroughly after lunch, after our mess. And I remember that was the first time I found out the Catholics actually believed in public like confession because she made us stand up one by one and confess as to whether or not we participated in the food fight. And I just remember her like shouting our names. She was like, Gloria! And you had to stand up, yes, Sister Carmelita. Did you participate in the food fight? Yes, Sister Carmelita, sit down! So one by one, she went through and she was raging. <laughs> So she was like, children, this is not acceptable, and I, la, 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 la. I don't really remember what <laughs> all she was saying, except that there was fury coming out of this religious sister's mouth. And we were right across the parking lot from the cathedral church, and there was a lower church down there that had adoration. And sister said, children, we are going over to adoration right now because I need to pray, and you need to pray to God for forgiveness. And I don't know how I held my breath from that classroom to walking across the parking lot into getting into the lower church, but I knew I wanted to live. And Sister Carmelita was on the edge of, you know, sentencing us to death, she was so enraged. So we're walking over there, and I, Sister's just, you know, I think she's like, she's just really angry. And as we get into uh, the lower church, they have the monstrance exposed, and Sister's kneeling down in front of the monstrance, and I can see her from the back. And she's doing like this, and I can see her habits swaying, and she's just working it out with Jesus. So, but while we're sitting there, terrified and very quiet because we don't want to get in any more trouble, I just remember, and I still remember the sensation now, even though it was decades ago when I was 12, being consumed by flames. Like, I, I knew my body was consumed in fire, but that it didn't burn. And at that moment that I was consumed in these flames, I had this, I, I can't describe it other than just a knowledge that what was in the monstrance was real and was alive. And it's a perception that's very hard to describe that knowledge, but it changed me. It reminded me of the gentleman that was up here saying, we hope that it changes your way of thinking, your time your courts with Abby. But it changed me fundamentally in that moment. And I went to the principal the next day, when she had come, actually the next couple of days, she'd come back to the class and said, it's time for me to get the Catholics and prepare you for confirmation. And I said, Sister Carmelita, I think I'm supposed to be a Catholic. And she was like, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> nope, nope, you're not just going to come up here and say you're going to be a Catholic. You need to go home to your parents and ask their permission. And so I did precisely the opposite. <laughs> I went home and I informed my parents that I was becoming Catholic. Now, mind you, 12 years old, announcing to my parents that I'm going to be a Catholic and they're not Catholic and nobody in the family is Catholic. And I just remember my father looking at my mother and saying, what is she talking about? And my mother said, oh, you're going to be a Catholic? And I was like, yes, yes I am. She says, well, okay, here's how it's going to go. You're going to go to Mass every Sunday, every Holy Day of Obligation. You're not going to eat meat on Fridays when you go to pray the rosary. You got it? And I was like, bet. And so that was my life. <laughs> that was my life, really. <laughs> 12 years old, getting dropped out to the Catholic Church by myself, while my family went to their respective churches. People in my family were different faiths. My grandmother was a Baptist, my mother and sister were the Methodists, and my father was NFL. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> I should laugh about that. Um, but the Eucharist really changed my life in a way that is hard to describe. And I thought it was really important to talk to you more, not just not only just about church teaching, but really personal, my personal experience with the Eucharist and how it changed me and what it fostered in my life, how it developed my faith, if you will. Um, and I think the first thing that it did for me is it made me understand that I had certain responsibilities, I guess, although I didn't see them as a responsibility, 
but more things that attracted me because of the Eucharist. So that I did go to Mass every Sunday, every holy day of obligation. I didn't mind giving up meat on Fridays. And by the way, my mother was like, I'm not cooking twice, so everybody's giving up meat on Friday. Um, and how it really changed, not just for me, but actually my entire family, the belief, a belief in God. And understanding that being a member of the church and professing what we profess every Sunday or if you go to Mass daily, if you say the creed, what that really means, right? And when we say these words like, I believe, and you're at Mass, and we're going to Mass, hopefully that we're in a position to receive the Eucharist, right? And but we say, before we receive the Eucharist, we profess out loud in front of everybody present, and not only everybody present, but God himself and the entire celestial court, what we believe. And if we say these things, it has consequences for how we should live our lives. And we say these things because we are going to the Eucharistic table to partake in what God left for us here, this heavenly food. But I, I was telling people we should believe, behave, and belong, the three Bs, right? And all of that is around the Eucharist, at least for me, my understanding of faith. The importance of the Eucharist, this heavenly food, Christ himself, that he left for us to partake in our earthly journey. And there are going to be many challenges along the journey. Challenges to what we believe, right? Challenges to how we're supposed to behave, and therefore how we belong to the church. The unity that it fosters, how we should live our lives, what our beliefs are. And you know, I would think that, oh yeah, you know, once I'm out of my parents' house and, you know, college and work and all that, that you wouldn't have these kind of outward challenges, at least in my naivete, to the faith. But I had the most challenges to my faith actually when I worked in corporate America. I remember uh, one uh, young lady was telling me that her friend, who used to be Catholic, who's now a pastor, would always mock her about the Eucharist. Just in horrible, nasty days, like, what part of Jesus did you eat on Sunday? You know, and I said, did you tell him his entirety, body, blood, soul, and divinity? That's what we receive when we receive the Eucharist? And I saw her just like, writing up, like, oh yeah, that's right. And I was like, but this shouldn't be a gotcha that you're trying to respond to him, if you're telling him the truth of what we believe. And you will have those challenges. You will have people questioning, what is that that you do? Why do you do that? Why can't I come up there and join in with you. I remember taking my uh, cousin to Mass. She's not Catholic, actually has some questions about this whole Pope thing and whatnot, but she'd gone to Mass with me, and she was like, well, can I go up and receive communion? And I said, well, do you believe everything that we believe? And she was like, yeah, I believe in God. I said, but it's a little bit more than that as Catholics. We believe that what you're receiving is really Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Not a symbol, but in reality, although we can only perceive the the symbols of the bread and the wine. We can only see that, but the perception of what is really there, do you believe that? And she was kind of like, I know, yeah. And I was like, sorry, you, know, you, you still can't go up because you actually don't belong to the faith. And she was upset about that a little bit. And I said, we, you can get into RCI back in Texas when you go home and become a Catholic. This is not barred from you. You are definitely welcome once you come and understand what we believe and join in with us, join in as Catholics, and approach the Eucharistic table. This is a, a sign, but a real, a real, a reality that's beyond our human perception of what is there. But we go and receive that. And in order to receive that, you know, that's what we say the, the uh, I'm forgetting the technical name of when you sort of like ask for forgiveness of your sins, right, at the beginning of Mass, I'm blanking on my control. Thank you, Father. Penitential right, how can I not know that? But when you do the penitential right during Mass, you know, it, it's, it's why we are able to go up and receive, assuming we're not in, in mortal sin. And I said, these are things that you need to understand and do as a Catholic in order to receive the Eucharist. But that was too much for her. That was too much. She was like, I forget it. I don't believe that much. And I was like, it's okay. But even when I would go back to my mother's church, I would go to Mass Saturday night, and sometimes she'd ask me to come to church with her on Sunday, and they'd always say, if it was, I can't remember if it was the first, third, or fourth Sunday, when they would do their, their, their communion service, they'd be like, boy, come on up, you used to be a Methodist? And I was like, that's the key word, used to, I'm a Catholic now, I cannot come up and receive 
with you and everybody in the church legitimately would come back, come on girl, come on up there. And I had to say, no, because I'm not in union with them. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I believe in the Trinity. But I believed other things that they did not believe. So I was not properly in union with them to go and receive what they had for their communion symbol. Just like they would not be able to come into our church and receive the Eucharist. Now it was not to me so much a matter of separation as much as it was a matter of a demonstration of what I actually believed. Even though they were welcoming me to receive uh, their communion. But I understood that the Eucharist, what I received, I needed to be faithful to. And so I didn't see that so much as rejecting them as much as it was affirming what I actually believed and how that would affect my behavior, even though I was invited to join in at their communion table. And sometimes for you, that's going to be the case, right? You have to remember, remind yourself, well, what do I believe? How is that going to affect my life? How am I reacting to other people? Is it really rejecting them or affirming what I myself believe? And that's how I saw it. And, and so people weren't necessarily insulted, but they just were sort of perplexed at the why I did not come back up when I was invited in a church that I used to be a member. And I was like, because I understand what the Eucharist is for myself as a Catholic and what this is not. And I wanted to be faithful to God. Because ultimately, it isn't to me just about um, saying that you're Catholic, but also what is that relationship to God that we have? When we say we believe and we go up and receive him, there is a union that I'm seeking with God himself. And I think that's a much more deeper thing to ponder. Because when we go up and receive the Eucharist, you know, I'm not so much concerned about really what anybody else thinks. I'm concerned about what I'm conveying to God. And I'm concerned about what is he conveying back to me about me as his child. And I also go up and I understand that he's given me strength until the next time I receive the Eucharist. Strength to really withstand my own fallenness, my own brokenness. Strength to withstand the temptations of the enemy. And strength to really practice what I preach, if you will, or what I believe. And it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. Yes, I know we have... We go to Mass once a week, you know, we're only required to go Sundays and whatever the Holy Days of Obligation are. But you can also go daily, right, and receive our Lord. That's a sort of relatively new thing, actually, in the history of the church, of daily Mass, receive Eucharist daily for lay people. But it's a way to, I would say, strengthen your relationship with Him. To remind yourself that you are made in His image and likeness, and with that comes a certain dignity and respect. And that dignity and respect that you merit and are worthy of, everybody else is worthy of that dignity and respect as well. So it, it challenges me as to how I see other people, how I behave and respond to other people, how I deal with my own fallenness, my own passions, my own concupiscence, my own tendency towards sinfulness. And that's when I run back to the Eucharist and say, Lord, give me strength. I think of the Israelites in the desert with their, what is it, pillar of salt, pillar of fire, that constant reminder that God is with them, among them, protecting them. I really see the Eucharist in that way also, that God is with us, that we can receive him, that we can be strengthened by him day by day. And I think of us also fortified by praying, trying to lift our mind to God, to remember he is greater than us and that he is always with us. And I hope you all do that. I hope you as young people really are praying. Now, I'm not saying you have to spend hours in prayer. You can open your eyes and just say, thank you, God. And throughout the day, go and refresh yourselves by just lifting your mind to him occasionally, remembering he is with you, especially if you're feeling lonely or down. You're really not ever alone. God is with you. And in a particular physical way, you can receive him in the Eucharist, that really intimate unity uh, with God, which is something so special. And I don't think I really understood it, I mean, at 12 years old, because I still had a lot of life to live, a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, wisdom to grow in. 
But I do know that it changed me in a very specific way. My family noticed the change, mainly in that I wasn't going to church with them. Also in the way in which we prayed before meals and after meals. Also the holy water all over the house. I think they were like, we Catholics got a whole lot of stuff. All these icons, these rosaries, things that they had not had before because, you know, we weren't Catholic. And then thanks be to God, all my sisters on their own converted to Catholicism. So it turned out that my parents were the only non-Catholics in the house. And that changed them too. Because when we bought a new house, they were getting ready to move in. Everything was all moved in. They're like, okay, we're gonna stay here tonight. And we were like, we can't sleep here. And they were like, why? We were like, we can't sleep here until the priest left the house. Sorry, it's not happening. Have you not seen the exorcist? You know? <laughs> we didn't say that, so. but we did tell them they couldn't, we couldn't stay in the house. And so my parents went and got the local priest by the big room. They had so rest in peace. And I think they were in awe of how we were just walking through the house with the holy water saying the prayers with the priest, uh, sanctifying the place. And that was another change. You know, all of this because we approached the Eucharistic table. It had an impact outside of just the mass. What did we believe? How should it affect how we live? Were we ashamed of that in front of people who didn't understand it? Were we willing to be ridiculed for people who didn't understand the faith? And the answer was yes, because we really didn't care what other people thought. And I think there's sort of a liberation in uh, uh, knowing who it is that's at Mass, who it is that we receive in the Eucharist. And how if I say I love God, then I'm okay with people making fun of me for my relationship with Him. Because I'm not so much concerned with appeasing them as much as I am concerned with developing that relationship with he who I say I love. And how does that love impact the life of a teenager, preteen, a teenager, a woman in her 20s, a woman in college, going married, all that kind of stuff, a woman in corporate America. All of these things matter. And I really believe I could not have stayed rooted in the faith without my Eucharist, without that weekly encounter with Jesus. Now, I will say this too. I had to do a lot of preparing before I received the Eucharist. And one of the things that I remember was the first time I went to confession. And you know, if you go to confession, you want to prepare before you receive the Eucharist. I would say it's like going to Thanksgiving dinner without ever having babies. I mean, who would do that, right? So you go and take a shower, if you will, in the Eucharist to prepare yourself. A shower in the sacrament of reconciliation to prepare yourself to sit at the table to receive our Lord. And I just remember the first time, I still remember the first time I went to confession. Why? Because I went face to face, because I didn't know that people didn't do that. And um, my husband was going to say, you know, you don't have to go face to face, so think about how long I was going face to face. But I, I found that for me, to go face to face to the sacrament of reconciliation made it, and not saying that you have to do this, it just made it more concrete and real. I understood that Christ was present in the priest, and I also understood that the priest was my neighbor. Because when I sin, it's also against my neighbor that I am sinning. It's chiefly against God himself, but also against my neighbor. And so how right it is for me to go into the sacrament of reconciliation in preparation to have, to be united with Christ, that I would seek reconciliation with him there and with my neighbor as well as represented by the priest, who also represents Christ. And I don't think we think about that enough. To prepare ourselves to receive him is out of respect and love for God. You know, some people are like, oh, I remember talking to this guy. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to confession anymore because, you know, I get like a couple of Hail Marys. And I was like, fool, you better go. You better take that run. I was like, if that's all you're getting, you should be thankful. I was like, what do you want? You want the priest to uh, tell you we have to nail you to the door or something? I said, that's God's mercy that you're getting a Hail Mary. I said, you, in your pride, you're being very prideful. I said, you should receive that with many thanks and say those Hail Marys with tears in your eyes. That the Lord allows you and the Lord is willing to allow this repair when we betray him through sin. And he was looking at me like, you know, I never thought about it like that. And I was like, yeah, we should. We should think about how generous he is in allowing us to come back to him and allowing us to receive him. 
He who sees all of our sins. He who died on the cross for us. He who took up a cross for you and me when we were still his enemies through sin that we freely chose. There's something beautiful about that. And then he would allow us to come back to the Eucharistic table. You see, if you say you believe and you're approaching the Eucharist, you should also be looking at how you behave. What in your life may be challenging you? What in your life may be stopping you? And offering all that to the Lord, praying, asking for his grace, asking for his help. My thing was I had a temper. What did I have temper? I punched out glass because I was upset waiting on something. I saw the scars between my fingers from that. So I had to learn a lot of patience. I had to learn to keep my hands to myself because I was not against punching in the face. <laughs> if you made me upset in school, that was my favorite Catholic school. All these things, these passions of mine that I had to learn to master. And I didn't understand, you know, how maybe these things could be simple. Because it seemed rational to me that, you know, if someone so pushed me, I'm going to punch him. And I had to learn that there was a different way to resolve issues. Although I was like, I thought I should defend myself by any means necessary. But I had to learn a better way. And for you, you'll learn better ways too from whatever it is that's challenging you as young people. And you should learn a better way because there's no, there's no happiness in the way of chaos, which is that other way, a way opposite of following Jesus and making yourself ready to receive him making yourself ready to follow him. And with the Eucharist, there's also something I think that we need to remember is a unifying aspect of our faith as Catholics. It's something we say we believe and we receive him. And that's something particular to us as Catholics when we go and receive the Lord, that we are saying we believe, we behave, we belong. And is that true? That's only something you can decide yourselves. I don't know the state of your soul. I don't know your relationship with Jesus. Only you do. And so I can't judge you as to whether or not you should receive. I know there's been a lot of conversation about who can receive the Eucharist. To be honest with you, I'm very concerned about whether I can receive it or not. Because only I know my interior state. Only I know what I do and don't do. And sometimes it's a temptation to say, oh, it's not so bad. You know, I think we should spend a lot more time determining our own relationship. The bishop's responsibility is everybody else. He can determine, you know, publicly certain things. And so I tend not to get involved in what I call the communion wars. And I tend to not get involved also because I think it narrows it simply to political talking points for political parties. Because if you can withhold publicly from this one person, what about everybody else? that participates in that kind of behavior. I think it's a dangerous thing for me as an individual to say whether or not you or you or you are worthy. Only I know whether I am worthy. And I know that's a temptation sometimes. And I keep thinking, why am I angry? Or why would I be angry if somebody else receives the Eucharist and I know that they're not, or I think I know that they're not doing X, Y, and Z? Why would I be angry? I mean, it's God's decision as to whether or not he shows up or not, honestly. But I need to be more concerned, I think, as to whether or not I am worthy. And I sometimes think that's the temptation of the enemy, that we think we're always so worthy and so good and somebody else isn't. And we need to be very, 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 very careful with that. And if you are pining for somebody not to receive the Eucharist, I'd say that's a prime example of not being worthy to receive yourself. Why would we ever have that kind of attitude? So I say think about that. Yes, the Eucharist does foster faith. Yes, the Eucharist does foster unity. But only if we are open and willing to what the Eucharist says about who God is and who we are. And if we are willing to behave in a way according to our faith that makes us worthy to receive him. And I think that's why we have the sacrament of reconciliation, because a lot of times we ain't worthy. 
And I'll tell you this quick Eucharistic story. I'm not sure if I'm close to my half hour or not, because I'll end up talking, talking, talking. Couple minutes, yeah. I'm good? Yeah. OK, so uh, a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine, who uh, she actually converted to Catholicism after I was made fun of at work. She witnessed how I was made fun of um, on Ash Wednesday. I had come to work with the ashes on my forehead, and the manager of the office called a meeting. And we come to the meeting, and the whole meeting was really to ridicule me because I had ashes on my forehead. And um, I guess I was really more surprised. I'm like, can you really? <laughs> but what I did is instead of raging, like I would have if I had not mastered you know, my emotions, I would have gone off on her. But instead, I reminded everybody that the ashes were a reminder for us to repent because we someday too will return to ashes from which we came. And I invited everybody in the meeting to come to Mass with me. And one person said yes. And from coming to Mass with me and me explaining the faith to her, she had this miraculous conversion. This is all that I can call it. Radical conversion. It really changed her life. So anyway, many, many years later, this same person called me. I was like, Gloria, I need to tell you what happened in confession today when I went to confession. I was like, do not tell me what you confess. She said, no, 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 I'm not going to say that. She said, but I want to tell you, and forgive me, Father, and any other priest that may be present. But she said to me, she said, you know how sometimes you get a confession, the priest is like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yeah. She said, well, the priest today was like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> she said, but emanating from him was this intense love. She said, I felt the presence of Jesus and his intense love for me that was so overpowering. She said, I could not get up from kneeling when I was in the sacrament of reconciliation. She said the love that was just, she said it just took her over. And she said, all this is what the Lord gives to us, how much he loves us. She said, could you imagine what is sending to us when we receive the Eucharist? And I know that sometimes, you know, people tell these stories, and it's not to say that we are any kind of special, super holy soul, as much as it is a reminder for the whole community of who is present in the sacrament. And that great love that God has for us, not only in sacrament of reconciliation, but also especially in, this, in the Eucharist, which I believe this love, this grace it receives, helps to foster our faith, strengthens us to be able to behave according to our faith, and reminds us that we belong all to the Eucharistic table that God has set for us if we are willing. So I think I'm going to be in my 30 minutes, sorry I talked so long, but if you have a question, stand. and also, by the way, you might ask a question for a friend. You might be asking not just for yourself, but for a friend, so ask away, no matter if it's a difficult thing. So if you could stand up, say your name, and what year you are, and ask a question.
with that. It's hard to put it in words, but just knowing that that was real and alive, that it was not some inanimate object that was there. That's what I, that's what I meant, and I hope that comes across. Yes. I'm a former rabbi, I'm a senior, and my question is, do you think you would have still found your way to Catholicism if you didn't go to Catholic school? No. No, absolutely not. I would have had no interaction with Catholicism at all if I hadn't gone to Catholic school. I mean, driving by a church here and there, but actually the practice of it, the exposure to the Mass, no way. Absolutely not. I probably wouldn't be Catholic if I hadn't gone to Catholic school because I would have had no opportunity to, to know anything about the faith because it never came up in conversation in our household. Never. Anything about Catholicism. And I will say, actually, after I converted, that it was my Baptist grandmother that really helped me with a lot of Catholic devotions, things I had no idea about. Like we used to drive by Catholic church and she elbowed me and she said, you're supposed to make a sign of the cross. <laughs> you know? She, went, she took a rosary and she said, hey, come here, I want to show you something. And you know, since we're from the South, she had those big, grand, four-poster beds. So she put the rosary on one of the, I guess, upside-down legs, did you call it? that was right next to her Bible. You know, she's a Baptist, Bible's everything. So she had the rosary right next to her Bible. She says, I want to put this here to let you know it's okay to pray it and that I'm supporting you in praying this. And my grandmother's the reason why I got to meet Mother Teresa, now St. Teresa of Calcutta, because when she came to Charleston, oh, and by the way, like I said, all my sisters converted. So my grandmother went to her son and said, Jesse, this lady's important to all your children. They're Catholic. Pack up the car. We gotta go see her. And then when uh, St. John Paul II came to Columbia, South Carolina, it was my Baptist grandmother that made sure we got to go see him. Jesse, pack up the car. All you kids are Catholic. This man's important to him, to them. And so, uh, you know, I love to think about that, how God in his way, even though I was the only Catholic in my family, how much support I actually had to practice Catholicism from my Baptist grandmother and from my parents, basically changing the way the whole family lived to support my practice of the faith. God is just very good that way. Any other questions? Yes. I'm Atticus, I'm a senior. That perception of the Eucharist that you said you gained during adoration, would you have said that was sort of an instantaneous realization of this form of gradual understanding? Instantaneous. I mean, from that point forward, I knew I was going to be a Catholic. I knew that was real. The attraction it's so hard to describe, but just the attraction to God that way has always stayed with me. And I think it's what allowed me to really be like, I'm okay being the only Catholic in this household and having to go to church when nobody else is going to church. And you see, because as uh, Protestants, they didn't go to church for one on Sunday, and that included Christmas. So leaving to go to church, go to Mass on Christmas when everybody else is at home, I, it just, I didn't feel like it was a punishment either. I just, it felt very natural after that experience. It felt like, I mean, what else would I do <laughs> with my life if I had come to understand and believe this? Um, so, yeah, it was an immediate. But then the, the change in my life, you know, became gradual, gradually changing um, to becoming Catholic and then full practice of the faith once I became Catholic. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, my name's Sean, I'm a sophomore. I uh, was wondering what made you want to do like EWTN. Oh, I didn't want to do EWTN. I didn't want to do TV. I didn't want to do media. I, I had no desire to do public speaking. None of that, ever. I mean, that was not my idea, ever. I, I was in, I did like risk management, like I financial risk management, like counterparty risk, credit risk, derivatives, mortgage-backed securities. That was my career. Um, but God had other plans, and you know, when you say yes to God and mean it, He will make things happen. And so, um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. When I got married, uh, we actually were at Mass at St. Augustine Church, Washington, D.C., and we were saying a creed. And the part we said, I believe the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and giver of life, I had what I would call like a mini chastisement from God. Because when I said, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and giver of life, I sort of, I heard a voice sort of say to me, are you blaspheming? Are you lying? How can you say you believe this when you are not defending my gift of life? Or not? How can you expect to receive the gift of eternal life? You know, it was just like a, and it was like a, a, a millionth of a second, really, that I had this 
many chastisements. I fell to my knees during Mass, and my husband was like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. But at that moment, I was like filled with the desire to know what the church taught about the human person and why. And it was from that moment forward that I just was like, Lord, I will, I will speak. I will just send me wherever. And then all these opportunities started to happen on my job where I had a lot of chance to witness to the truth. I thought I'd get fired. I was like, well, you know I got a mortgage. You're going to pay that. But the funny thing was, the more that I was challenged at work, the more that I was able to witness, I just kept getting promoted. <laughs> it was weird. But um, I didn't want to do EW10. I didn't want to do any of that. And when they came to me, actually a friend of mine had been like, Roy, you need to do a TV show for them. And I was like, I'm not interested. And he was after me for eight years. And so in prayer, um, actually on the Feast of St. Teresa of Avila, which is coming right up, it's not right soon, um, it became very clear to me that they were going to do a particular thing. So I sent this letter to EWTN. They accepted my proposal for a TV series. And then I thought it was good. I'm gone. I'm done. And then after that, just all these other things. Come and do this. Come and talk here. Come and, you know, I ended up always arguing with people someplace about the faith. But somehow, just from saying yes, I ended up doing radio and New York Times and PBS and all these things. None of it I wanted to do, ever, really. And I resisted it for a long time, so I was that. Not, not a big girl there. But thank you for asking. I have a question. Yes. Oh, yes, right yeah, go, go for it. Go for it. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a freshman. You mentioned St. Teresa of Avila. Are there any other saints whose personal experiences with the Eucharist affected your relationship with Christ? Yeah, let me think about that. Well, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't say it was an essay there, uh, relationship with the Eucharist, as much as it was reading their writings. So St. Teresa of Avila sort of fried my wig. I'm actually a thorough Carmelite because of her and Our Lady. But um, I remember reading her book, one of her books, and in it she says, that prayer and comfortable living don't go together. And I threw the book across the room because I was like, I like comfortable living. <laughs> but I, I realized what she was trying to say. St. Um, Francis de Sales, Introduction to the Devout Life. Completely love, love, love that book. Catherine of Siena and the Dialogues. Woo-wee. Love it. I love the mystics, apparently, I think. So those books really uh, have done a number on me in terms of my faith, in terms of my prayer life. Done a number in a good way, I would say. And so I would recommend uh, any of those books to anybody who's interested or maybe even attracted to um, St. Teresa of Avila or St. Francis de Sales or St. Catherine of Siena. So, thank you. I think somebody else will be, somebody else had a hand up for the show. Right over here, yes. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about how Catholic, uh, Catholic ethics affected your work in corporate America? My name? Oh, yeah. So, yes. So how Catholic ethics affected my work in corporate America. Yeah, always focusing on the person and realizing uh, and trying to remind people that we do things not just for the sake of profit, but that we also have to remember they have real human impacts. How do they impact the human person, the family, and whatnot? Uh, and if we were going to have policies, how are they going to help the human person? And to remember that the economy exists to serve the human person and not the other way around. And sometimes I think those are very difficult conversations because people wanted to maximize profit at the expense of the community, at the expense of the impact on the community of people. And uh, so those were not popular conversations, especially with people who, you know, human person, what do you talk about, community? So I would have to say things like, you know, reputational risk. Sometimes you have to say things to people to get them to do the right thing in ways that they only can understand. So when you're speaking, you talk about, you know, it's a reputational risk for the corporation if you do X, Y, and Z, because it'll have this negative impact on the community, which will bring a kind of uh, uh, spotlight, negative spotlight on the company that maybe we don't want. So you have to be able to couch it in terms that everybody else could understand. Reputational risk <laughs> was one of the ways that I was able to do that. So, thank you for asking that. Two more? Huh? Two more questions? Two more, sure. Are there anybody have two more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Blake. I'm a senior. Who, who were some of your role models growing up? My mom. Who's that my role models? My mom. Uh, my mom. 
And the reason I say that, especially now thinking back, now that she, she died three, three years ago, actually, yeah, three years ago, was because when I became Catholic, that was a big sacrifice for my mother because she was super active in her Methodist church. She played the organ, she did, kept the books for the church, I used to be able to all to serve with me, my sisters were all just so present in the church. And so for her to go one Sunday and me not be there, and they're like, where's Gloria? And she had to tell my Gloria's Catholic now, she's not coming back, she goes over to St. Catholic's church. I, I wonder how much people whispered about her. And you know what, she never, ever, ever, ever once Complain or say you're you know embarrassing me or this is costing never. She always supported me in my walk as Catholic and then with all my other sisters. My mother was just the most gracious, patient woman ever. And actually, I remember, um, gosh, the Lord is so good. After she was she was declared brain dead, and um, me and my sister didn't know this, but my father knew, and he was going to pull the plug. But he told the doctors he had to wait for her children to come back. So she was brain dead for a week in the hospital. They had on a breathing machine. And we all came back and we walked into the ICU. And you know, we prayed and all this stuff all the time for her. We had a green scapular, a stone circle, or an infant frog metal. And she moved her right side. And my father, the NFL guy, screamed out, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe, I believe, I believe. Because the dead can't move. And that's when he broke down and told us he was going to pull the plug. She was had to be put brain dead, blah, 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 blah. And the doctor's like, oh, it's just, she dead. That's just a freak thing. Then she moved the left side, the other side. Then I'm like, still, we don't, you know. All this in one day. And then an hour later, she opened her eyes. And they were like, she'll never understand you. Then she was nodding. And then they were like, we don't know what's going on. And we're like, this is what's going on is the divine physician is manifesting his power. Because all things belong to God. And after that miraculous sort of healing, we went to Lourdes, took my knock at the parents of Lourdes, and she stood up in her Methodist church and said, I'm gonna be gone for two weeks, because you know the one that left and became Catholic, Gloria? She's taking the Lourdes. So she announced her whole church, she's going to Lourdes, and then do you know what? Everybody came up to her after church like, Betty, bring me back some of that Lourdes water. <laughs> and you know what? Her mom brought back like a mega super uber sized Lourdes water which sits in the entrance of the little Methodist church there in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> so my mother is definitely my, my inspiration. Thank you for that question. Love you, share from the brother mom. I appreciate that. Yes? Um, I'm going to ask you again. Um, you seem to be very confident as a Catholic. And I was just wondering whether any time when you suffer or like you struggle um, being calm, like if someone in front of you or anything, like is there a kind of struggle with it? I guess, um, I mean, I never not believed. And yes, the struggle when you're suffering, when you're going through a hard time, and that's what it is to struggle in the faith. Um, but I guess that's when I had a choice, right? Um, I had a choice to either persevere in the faith or to try to go along with whatever was happening. Um, I had a lot of um, uh, problems on my corporate job with um, uh, particular people who were um, Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, just over and over, I would get, they would come and say just these awful things to me about Catholicism, things that weren't true. And um, that was very troublesome for me. I mean, it's just a small example. Or other times people would say things about Catholicism. They, oh, that's the other thing, being a black person, they never assumed you were Catholic. So I remember I was in a corporate meeting, and this one guy got up and was making fun of the Pope. And I was like, oh, surely somebody else got to say something. And nobody did. I said, well, hold up. Let me just tell you something. I'm a Catholic, and you got it all wrong. That's not what we believe about our Holy Father. So I went on to explain to him what he had wrong. And everybody, I was a black person also, <laughs> and everybody in the room was like red-faced. And I was like, I can't be only Catholic in here. But I, either way, I was only Catholic willing to stand up and say something, because I feel like if you are in a corporate environment and somebody says something about the faith that's wrong, I am entitled to respond. And that's not harassment or religious hostility or anything like that, but somebody else brought it up, I think I'm entitled to respond. And I would offer a response because I experienced a lot of that at work. Or even just going to corporate lunches with executives and doing this and praying before my meals. People were like, cut off. And I, and I remind them, I said, well, we have an Office of Diversity and Inclusion. 
you would respect me and, and include me as a black woman, I'm asking you to include me as a Catholic woman too. And this is my faith. This is important to me. This is who I am. I'm bringing my whole self to work. And uh, understanding that that did have, you know, I'm sure there, there were consequences that I didn't see, but that was all right with me. I was okay to pay that price. So, and also private things with friends. Oh boy, I can go on. Let's just say our, my beliefs about authentic womanhood. You know, I don't believe in artificial contraception because I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with me as a woman. That my body was made, you know, this reproductive system puts a function a certain way. And so I very much challenge um, a lot of the thinking about what it means to be a free woman. And I felt like all these other things seem to make what is naturally female some kind of defective part of us. And I was like, no, this is natural, this is right. And I'm not going to suppress it. And so, yeah, I have, people consider that very radical, but I consider that extremely feminist and very pro-woman, that uh, we would not subject our bodies to anything um, at the convenience of a corporation or other things. I'd rather challenge how uh, society treats us as women and our ability to bear children and mother and stuff like that. So I didn't talk about that, but I can talk about that after. <laughs> so is that any other questions? Okay, well thank you all so much for listening.